Hi there! In the last episode, I've shown you how to debug loading dependencies in Hanami applications by leveraging the power of dry container. This time, I want to dig deeper into the problem this gem solves with its friends and why it even exists. On the dryRB dependency graph I've created a while ago, you may see that dry container is actually one of the key gems in the whole dryRB ecosystem. And most cool gems from the dryRP family use it under the hood. But what is so special about it? Also, why in Hanami applications except dry container you have dry system and dry auto inject gems work together to handle loading dependencies? This is exactly what I will try to talk about today. Let's talk about dependency injection then, from scratch. Dependency injection in programming is a technique that allows building your applications around encapsulated, composable objects that can be easily replaced by something else if needed. Let's say there is a Hanami Master object and I want to subscribe to get updates. Hanami Master can ask another object to save the subscription while leaving the details on how to do it for that service. This way, as long as the interface is kept the same, we can replace the subscription service with whatever without a need to do a bigger refactoring. Dependency injection is one of the techniques helping to achieve that. While I know that the world doesn't need another post about dependency injection in Ruby, I decided to create one anyway to complement uh, this series and explain the Hanami approach to it. Dependency injection is a very simple concept and see the article created by Peter Solnica, which I link in the description for a numerous list of benefits it provides and how simple it can be. There is a lot of controversy on the web around providing arguments used only for testing purposes and a lot of people talking about the dependency injection in Ruby already focused on testing benefits. So I will skip that part, somewhat. Maybe except just saying that dependency injection is extremely useful in testing. After all, it's a pattern or technique, not religion. It can be used, but as probably any other programming pattern, it comes with a cost. This is why in dryRB family, there are three gems dedicated exactly to handle dependency injection problems. Those are dry container, dry auto inject and dry system. And I will cover each of them separately, but it's important to notice that you don't need any of those to implement dependency injection in Ruby. There is a lot of noise around the topic of DI in Ruby as DHH somewhat dislikes the idea, but just by looking at how popular some dry libraries are, one might easily disagree with DHH. He likes RSpec neither. Having that said, here is another example of DI in Ruby. Just a quick disclaimer, examples I provide in this episode will be kept in extremely simple form to show the issues. To grasp the concept properly though, you need to keep in mind that applications actually grow. So let's say I have this code. It's just a dummy code snippet, but I want to keep things simple. Imagine though that your app won't stay this small for long, or that it's a just a tiny part of a larger system. When I call it, I will get some logs and that's all. It's easy, but there are few problems here. First of all, the logic responsible for generating logs is placed directly in different classes, which makes it hard to refactor. If you will ever want to add additional logging channel like paper trail or even on S3 bucket, you will have a hell in replacing all log calls in your application. You can easily solve it by adding a logger class that hides the logic and provides own interface to generate and send logs. This approach hides the logic logic somewhat, but it's far from perfection. When I call my services multiple times, 
It will instantiate my logger each time and it doesn't really solve the problem of replacing the logger easily in whole classes. Nobody wants to wonder in how many places in class itself I need to replace the logger when a new logging mechanism is introduced. As logger is a dependency, we can move the initialization into the initialize method of the classes using it, which will keep instantiation logic in one place. Please notice that I identified that email subscription service is also a dependency of my become awesome subscriber command and I extracted it too. Now we are one step closer to the composable code and our refactoring would be a bit simpler. Now I only need to look at initialize methods if needed and replace logger there. However, it's still a lot of places to check in case you want to do this change. Also, there can be some performance problems hidden here. When I will just instantiate the become awesome subscriber service object, I will end up with two instances of logger class, both completely identical. And every time something will use my classes, new loggers will be created. I know how it looks. What's the point of it, you may ask? Two or three more objects? Who cares? Well, I do care. When you start working on a big project, memory optimizations actually start to matter. This is an extremely small example, but if your code is not optimized in the framework you use and across the whole project, you may easily end up with thousands or tens of thousands of unnecessary objects generated all the time everywhere. This is just one reason why Hanami 2 is so much more memory optimized in comparison to Rails. So, in our example, we may do better though by allowing to inject our dependencies. With this, we can finally solve all our problems. Wait, what? I reduced the number of objects generated, but there is still a flow in the example. As I don't pass email subscription service to the become awesome subscriber command and it also uses logger, new logger objects are still regenerated. It's easy to fix it by a little tweak to the code calling my example. I did this mistake intentionally to present how easy it is to overlook objects initialization and miss one dependency if you do things manually, but it's already fine. With this, we have implemented the complete dependency injection mechanism. Now you can easily test your classes on the unit level by just injecting dependencies when needed and use mox objects freely. Different parts of your system can use different loggers and much fewer objects are created across the system. But when the application grows though, you start to see a bit more problems, naming problems in particular. If you have a project supporting multiple contexts, the number of namespaces in the system grows very quickly. You may keep your file names flat, but you can't avoid long names at all. If you ask me, I hate flat file structures. Let me create my example classes with a bit more structure in mind then. I have my logger class renamed to IO logger. My image subscription is not changed, but it's placed within infinite number of namespaces and I moved become awesome subscriber to a separate context. You can feel the pain, can't you? This is a bit frustrating to define manually all those dependencies over and over again and this actually can become very hard to maintain very quickly. And this is where dry container comes in with help. In all of the examples above, each of the class needed to know exactly how to resolve all dependencies of all other dependencies, or we could end up with multiple instances of the same classes being created all over the place. We either need to set defaults, which makes our init method unclear very quickly, or we will end up with troubles figuring out what the class accepts. The idea behind dry container is to extract this knowledge into one place. Let me create the container to visualize it to you.
Now I can register my dependencies in one file, having only one place where all my components are resolved. With this, we can completely get rid of any default arguments in all our classes, because we can now resolve all our dependencies during boot time and always use already resolved objects. Then using this would be as simple as just calling the proper container keys. If I will now want to do the same check as before with counting objects, I will get no issues whatsoever. The usage is much more simple now, but imagine this for larger applications. When I want to use anything, we don't need to resolve all dependencies manually, but just rely on the container to do it properly. With a single line of code, our container can resolve whole trees of dependencies without any overhead from our side. On top of that, while dry container allows us to lazy load dependencies on runtime just when they are needed, we can also load them all at once on boot time which might be useful for production environments. Also, you might easily get an overview of everything that's happening in your system. I described it in details in episode 13, so feel free to check it out. Dependency injection is awesome, but comes with own headaches. Dry container streamlines resolving dependency trees and keeps our app memory optimized and fast by loading only what's necessary or everything at once if we want. What I described above is only a scratch of benefits Dry Container provides. Some other cool things associated with it are that it's thread safe. You can define multiple containers for multiple parts of the system, which is exactly what Hanami does with slices. And it's priceless in testing. Yeah, I know I'm supposed to not talk about it. However, it's still only one gem. So what are the others for? In the next episode, I will showcase the dry auto inject and dry system gems. So stay tuned for that. That's all for today. I hope you enjoyed this episode and you will give dry container a try. If you want to see more content in this fashion, subscribe to my YouTube channel, newsletter and follow me on Twitter. I want to especially thank my recent sponsors, Andrzej Krzywda, Sebastian Hriber and Yuzeo for supporting this project. I really appreciate it. By helping with a few dollars per month creating this content, you are helping the open source developers and maintainers to create amazing software for you. And remember, if you want to support my work even without money involved, the best you can do is to like, share and comment on my episodes and discussion threads. Help me add value to the open source community. If you know other great gems you wish me to talk about, leave a comment with hashtag suggestion and I will gladly cover them up in the future episodes. As usual, here you can find two of my previous videos. Thank you all for watching, you are awesome and have a nice rest of your day.